Today on Newswatch, detained in North Korea. See what the U.S. government is doing to help a Virginia student gain his freedom. Plus, we'll show you what's next after the State Department declared ISIS is committing genocide against Christians and other minorities. And... I think it's unique. My biggest prayer is that, that this will reach millions of people that would normally never hear the gospel. We take you behind the scenes of The Passion Live. Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Charlene Aaron. The U.S. is seeking the release of an American citizen detained in North Korea. The 21-year-old University of Virginia student was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for stealing a propaganda banner. But he may be freed sooner than expected. I have made the worst mistake of my life. The U.S. government is working to free 21-year-old Otto Warmbier an American student sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. The North Korean government says this video shows Warmbier stealing a political banner from the hotel he was staying at with a tour group on January 2nd. Warmbier's family is enlisting the help of former governor and U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Bill Richardson. He did a college prank, a mistake, but 15 years to be sentenced, that's crazy. Uh, hopefully now after the sentencing, it'll mean negotiations can start on his release on humanitarian grounds. Please save my life. Please think of my family. Close to a dozen American tourists have been arrested in North Korea in the last six years, often because of Christianity. All but one have been released. Kenneth Bay, a Korean-American missionary, was also sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for what North Korea called crimes against its state. He was released after just over two years. The Obama administration is demanding immediate pardon and release of warm beer. North Korea will likely try to drive for a bargain it wants, and it's likely the American government will be able to negotiate his release within a year or two, based on similar past arrests. Meanwhile, North Korea has launched two ballistic missiles off the west coast of the Korean peninsula. The U.S. military is closely tracking and monitoring that situation. The governor of Michigan and the Obama administration's top environmental official are under fire for their roles in the water crisis in Flint. EPA Chief Gina McCarthy and Governor Rick Snyder received harsh words at a government hearing, with some calling on both to resign. House Oversight Committee J Chairman Jason Chaffetz told McCarthy the, quote, courageous thing to do is abandon her position as the nation's top environmental protection leader. Meanwhile, Democrats on the committee say Governor Snyder is to blame for the situation. Idaho lawmakers are moving toward prohibiting Sharia law. A proposed bill would keep Idaho courts and government agencies from basing rulings on foreign and extremist laws. The bill's sponsor, Representative Eric Redmond, says Sharia law is seeping into U.S. and European court cases. Invoking foreign law and foreign legal doctrines is a means of imposing an agenda on the American people while circumventing the U.S. and state constitutions. The bill's future remains uncertain. Well, under pressure, the State Department has declared that ISIS is committing genocide against Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq and Syria. It's an important designation, but as White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon reports, this is only the beginning of the process. Pushing it right up to the deadline set by Congress, Secretary of State John Kerry said the words Christians and others waited to hear. In my judgment, Daesh is responsible for genocide against groups in areas under its control, including Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. It's a critical first step towards protecting Christians from ISIS and other Islamic radicals in Iraq and Syria. Every jihadist in the Middle East believes they can kill, kidnap, enslave, and otherwise torture Christians and other religious minorities, and they believe they can do it without repercussions. In northern Iraq, Assyrian Christians are an ancient people descended from the first followers of Christ. We are, as Assyrians of the Middle East, are we are on the verge of extinction. Juliana Tamarazi recently visited the town of Teleskov in the Nivea plains of Iraq, where 200,000 Christians have fled from ISIS. The homes are destroyed. Uh, they're ran inside. When you walk inside, uh, their closets are all broken, the beds are all overturned. 
the kitchens are destroyed. Secretary Kerry's genocide designation helps keep the plight of these Christians near the front of U.S. foreign policy. Advocates wasted no time celebrating. They're already working with the State Department to make sure Christians are represented in Syrian peace talks and that the property rights of Iraqi Christians forced to flee their homes are enforced. There are going to be borders redrawn, constitutions redrafted. It's absolutely essential that the Christians have a voice in this process or they will have no place in the new Syria and in the new Iraq. There's already an effort to create a safe haven in the Nineveh Plains so that Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities can return home, govern themselves, and rebuild their lives without fear of extermination. If you care about the presence of Christianity, the Christian witness, in this very gospel-poor part of the world, you will support the idea of a safe haven. In spite of the horrors they've experienced at the hands of ISIS, Christians in this part of the world are experiencing a revival of their faith. They have told me repeatedly, it is because of persecution that has been inflicted on them, that they have, been, that they have grown closer to Christ, that they find themselves praying more, that they, they're thirsty for the gospel more. Now the same advocates who pushed for the genocide designation are moving to keep up the pressure to ensure the Obama administration not only talks, but acts to protect those persecuted Christians and other religious minorities. They hope to make real progress before the next administration moves into the White House. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. An ancient biblical scroll has found a new home at Regent University. The Torah scroll contains the first five books of the Bible, and I was able to be there for the dedication of this special and rare gift. Dr. Robertson, it's with great pleasure that we gift this scroll to Regent University. May God bless you as you use it. This scroll was uh, copied or written in 1750 before the establishment of the United States of America, before the Constitution. And uh, uh, we will treasure this. It is a magnificent gift. The Torah scroll has survived some of the darkest periods of human history a powerful testament to God's faithfulness and the enduring power of his word. It's a Yemenite scroll, and it comes to us from that area, Yemen, where, of course, the King of Sheba came from. And it was a time period where Jews were severely persecuted. They had to kind of run for their lives, and they brought these Torah scrolls with them. Members of the Jewish community attended the dedication service, calling it a bridge between the Jewish and Christian communities. We had a common goal, both to, to continue the Judeo-Christian teachings, but also to support Israel and how critical it is for both of us. And so this program today really brought that together. Ken and Barbara Larson donated the scroll and have also gifted Taurus to several other institutions. They hope it will encourage students to develop a deeper appreciation for God's Word. So when you come to grips with how God brought this Torah here, our hope would be that the students would have that kind of appreciation for what he's done to keep his Word accurate, relevant, so we can all learn and grow. The Word of God will, will live forever. And in a Torah that's several hundred years old, will still continue to live and to speak. And many students will be able to gain from it. To receive this extraordinary ancient Torah scroll that students could look at and they can handle and in some, some instances could even touch, uh, enforces, solidifies this commitment that we've made to the Word of God. Dr. Becker says receiving the Torah is so important for Regent because, quote, the Word of God is the foundation for absolutely everything we do. Well, legendary gospel singer Daryl Coley died this week. The Grammy-nominated artist was best known for songs like He's Preparing Me, Beyond the Veil, and When Sunday Comes. His soulful style helped him to rise through the ranks to become one of the top singers in gospel music. Coley was also a minister and founded the Love Fellowship Tabernacle in Los Angeles, California. Singers like Kurt Carr and Smokey Norfolk took to social media to honor Coley. It is reported that he died in hospice care. Coley was 60 years old. Coming up, mending fences. See how this former Cuban captive's time in prison helped repair U.S. ties with the island nation.
An American who spent five years in a Cuban prison says President Obama's upcoming trip to Cuba is a courageous move. Alan Gross was a government contractor who was arrested for delivering Internet communications equipment to Cuban Jews. He was freed in late 2014. Our own Gary Lane recently sat down with Gross to discuss his imprisonment and how it helped to transform U.S.-Cuba relations. And after years in prison, we are overjoyed that Alan Gross is back where he belongs. Welcome home, Alan. We're glad you're here. The time that you were released, uh, right around that time is when President Obama announced uh, restoration of diplomatic relations. Today, the United States of America is changing its relationship with the people of Cuba. Well, it, it wasn't right around that time. It was exactly on the same day. Uh, on December 17th, 2014, 1,481 days after I was arrested, at least one plane took off from the United States with the three remaining Cuban intelligence agents uh, and, and our plane that had landed, Air Force One alternative that had landed at a Cuban airstrip to take me home, uh, was permitted to take off only after they had confirmation that their people were, were returned. Except but finally, the, uh, the president had the um, political strength to make the hard decision. Uh, and, and it was a historic decision in, in, in establishing a new policy, uh, U.S.-Cuba policy. Do you think, Alan, we'd have that new policy had you not been released if you were still in prison? Would I have been released if we didn't have the new policy? Absolutely not. They go hand in hand. So in that context, I was an involuntary catalyst uh, in the process of establishing a new foundation uh, for a relationship with our neighbor. And wh what do you think of that new foundation? Because you sat in a prison cell for five years. Uh, is it the right course? Well, absolutely. Uh, if we had had diplomatic relations 55 years ago, 50 years ago, 45 years ago, six years ago, I might not have had to forfeit five years of my life. The whole idea of constructive engagement helps to avoid circumstances like this. And people who are critical of the process that we've recently gone through uh, really need to take a look at that. And the president's preparing to go to Cuba? Yes, he is. You think that's a good thing? What are your thoughts? I'm not surprised that he wanted to go. Uh, I think he views Cuba as an important part of his legacy. Uh, and I think it is. After 55 years of a failed U.S. policy, uh, he's come up with some new direction that has much greater potential. I know that uh, he'll meet with uh, President Raul Castro. I hope that he does not meet with former President Fidel Castro. And I think what's more important is for the president, uh, the two presidents, to come to some, some form of understanding about human rights. Um, you know, the economy, uh, the Cubans are going to have to work out. Uh, if they don't improve, and, and the, their economy is in a shambles. It's, it's uh, yes, uh, it is. essentially disintegrating uh, because they don't produce. For more of Gary's interview and to hear how five years in prison affected Gross's Jewish faith, look for the Global Lane blog at CBNNews.com. Up next, a modern-day take on a 2,000-year-old story. The passion comes to life on the streets of New Orleans. If you have never seen the 1956 blockbuster movie, The Ten Commandments on the big screen, well, now's your chance. The legendary film will be shown in more than 650 theaters this Sunday and then again next Wednesday at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. on each day. The Ten Commandments tells the story of the Exodus, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses was played by Charlton Heston in one of the most famous performances ever. The Ten Commandments is still one of the highest grossing movies of all time. Well, TV networks have seen huge success with live musicals in recent years. More than 20 million people tuned in to see The Sound of Music on NBC. And this Palm Sunday, the Fox Network is broadcasting a live musical based on the crucifixion of Christ. 
Ephraim Graham traveled to New Orleans to bring us this behind the scenes look at the Passion Live. There is no fear now. I will love you. The final hours of Christ's journey on earth are coming to life with actor and award-winning singer Giancarlo Scanella taking on the lead role. How do you prepare to play Jesus? <laughs> That's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest honors I've ever been given. It's a musical take on the 2,000-year-old story set in the streets of present-day New Orleans. We're staying true to the biblical sense of it in the scriptures. That is intact. That is not being changed. No one is writing words in Jesus' mouth. Like, that's, that's not going to happen. But just everything that surrounds it refreshes the story. And I just feel that it's going to appeal to an even bigger audience that needs to hear that story about love and about acceptance and forgiveness. And I know that I needed to hear that message when this opportunity came into my life. Country superstar Trisha Yearwood plays the mother of Jesus, and New Orleans native son Tyler Perry narrates the two-hour Fox television special, which includes performances from gospel artist Yolanda Adams and American Idol alum Chris Daughtry. I am playing Judas, the bad guy, the, yeah. ultimate, the ultimate villain. But I think it's a character that, um, I think there's a bit of Judas that we can all relate to. You know, we've all made decisions that we didn't exactly think out the ramifications uh, before doing it, and we've all felt guilty for doing something. While this production is new to American television, it's become a tradition in the Netherlands. Er is te there are multiple moving parts throughout the Crescent City, a stage, big screens, and people carrying a 20-foot illuminated cross from the Superdome to the banks of the Mississippi. The massive production is part of what attracted Michael W. Smith to the project, playing one of Jesus' disciples. I like adventure. I think it's unique. I think it's really wild and a wild and wonderful idea that has worked in Holland, and why would it not work here? Um, found out who the cast was and, and just thought, this. I think I could sink my teeth into this thing. So. Here I am. Shane Harper. It's not even atheism anymore. But known for his breakout role in God's Not Dead, also plays a disciple. Um, there are people, you know, who are going to be very familiar with this story. Who grew up hearing about it in Sunday school. It's going to be people that, that haven't had that experience. Um, and I hope that uh, both of these groups of people um, will come with open hearts to this, to this performance. The play hangs on popular music, with lyrics rewritten to tell the story. I sing The Reason by Hoobastank, which for me was always a great song about love. You know, it was always one of my favorite records. And coming here to The Passion now, singing this song after Peter denies Christ three times, and now kind of seeing the song from a whole other point of view, it's definitely going to be, I think, an emotional performance. Unconditionally, I will love you. This is an emotional story of unconditional love. My biggest prayer is that, that this will reach millions of people that would normally never hear the gospel, but they would probably really, totally understand who Jesus really is. Because I think there's so many misconceptions about who he is. It's a prayer being answered on set, even as cast members practice for the live Palm Sunday performance. When I said yes to this, I, I started becoming even, even closer uh, than I was before to the story, to the scriptures, to the book, to the Bible. And, and in doing so, I just, I, I was reminded that yes, he was such a powerful being, but he was also human. And people forget that he was human, you know? And I think we need to be reminded of, of those moments of humanity. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New Orleans. And you can see The Passion live this Sunday night at 8 Eastern and 7 Central on the Fox Network. And our Ephraim Graham will be on site for the event, so be sure to follow him on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook to get live updates and behind-the-scenes footage. Cheers! Cheers! 
The movie Miracles from Heaven focuses in on the Beam household, a young family of faithful churchgoers who are living a good, honorable life in their small Texas hometown. It's a good life. <laughs> it's a good life. It's a good life. Then one night their happy world is shaken when middle daughter Anna is rushed to the hospital with severe stomach pains. After weeks of multiple medical diagnoses pointing to common illnesses, doctors realize that Anna's problem isn't common at all. In fact, she has an incurable and potentially deadly gastrointestinal ailment. Anna's ongoing physical anguish drives her mom, Christy, to hunt for some kind of solution. And she also has to hunt to find what's left of her faith as she grows increasingly angry at thick-headed Christians around her and the church she used to love. It soon begins to look like Anna will need a miracle to make it through her ever-worsening condition. But no one expects Anna's miracle to happen, especially the way it does. Based on a true story, this film motivates viewers to think about God's priorities, God's choices, and God's timing in our world and in our lives. It can be a little difficult at times to sit through young Anna's anguish as years of her life roll by, but this is an emotional testimony of suffering and miracles that approaches its topic with a gentle grace for those hesitant to believe. So I'm giving Miracles from Heaven a hearty four and a half trees to climb out of five for family friendliness. For a full detailed review, visit us at PluggedIn.com. Plugging you into the movies, I'm Bob Olszewski for Focus on the Family's Plugged In Movie Review. Well, that's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day and God bless.